morning, everyone. So um, this is the pediatric talk. It's divided into four talks and I will, four short talks. So I will start with um, the first one being septic arthritis, the update. Please just let me know if I am unclear or if you can't see my screen. Okay. Um, so let's start off with some definitions. Septic arthritis is uh, usually a bacterial infection of the synovium and subsequently of all the structures within the joint, which causes an intense inflammatory reaction, possibly leading to destruction of the articular cartilage and later of the complete joint. So uh, in pediatrics, the pathogenesis is usually hematogenous and can be contiguous, sorry about that, or a direct inoculation. Um, the patients, uh, how they present is a variation of these. They will present with a painful uh, swollen joint. They could be non-weight bearing or um, an antalgic gait. They may present with a pseudo paralysis of that limb. And sometimes, not all the time, they may have a fever. So in terms of your investigations, um, the clinical exam, uh, firstly, a history. Uh, John will speak to you guys about a specific pathogen that will usually present with uh, an upper respiratory tract infection, followed then by um, septic arthritis. Um, so they will usually present with inability to weight bear and fusion, loss of range of movement or a pseudo paralysis. As I said, a temperature. The investigations that you need to do will be a full blood count. Um, check for the HB and uh, if there is, uh, do a smear to check for sickling and also do a, um, a white cell count in that HB. The aspirate, you're checking for... Um, your routine MCNS and um, TB uh, gene expert. You will also check ESR and CRP, your inflammatory markers, and your basic investigations should be an X-ray. Um, in an X-ray, you can see soft tissue swelling, you can see um, fat pads, and you can see sometimes an effusion on an X-ray. And depending on where you are in your availability, um, either an ultrasound or an MRI and also depending on um, how the patient presents to you. So we all know of the COCA criteria to try to differentiate between uh, hip uh, septic arthritis to, uh, versus transient synovitis. So this is an article, um, a review article, retrospective review, uh, where these people looked at um, patients uh, retrospectively who came in with a COCA criteria of three or four. And then uh, what they did, because a COCA criteria, if, if, if you have three or four marks or score, then your probability of aseptic arthritis is more than 93%. But is it specific for an osteitis of proximal femur? So what they did was they reviewed patients who were three or four COCA, and they reviewed the patients who were three or four COCA um, who had ultrasounds and MRIs. And um, basically what they found was, if, if you combine just the COCA and the ultrasound alone, it, uh, it won't be sufficient to make the diagnosis um, of, of an osteitis. So they are leaning more towards um, doing an MRI in terms of uh, confirming if it is a septic arthritis or not, or an osteitis. So in terms of management, the streams of management that we all know, it's medical and surgical management. So uh, this article is just, uh, it's a review of the current management of um, septic arthritis in pediatrics. So what it says is antibiotics remain the gold standard and nothing's changed. It's empirical um, antibiotics um, and then you only after cultures do you downscale it. Um, still staph aureus is 
responsible for 70 to 90 percent and it's methicillin sensitive staph aureus. Uh, remember in the very young you or less than two months of age don't forget your strep and your other gram negative organisms. Uh, between ages two and five years old it's mostly strep parginis, strep pneumonia should also be considered and Haemophilus has declined due to the uh, vaccination programs and also in this age group don't forget the uh, what do you call it, the ninja, is what I call it, the kingela kinge. I'm not going to get into it, John has a presentation on that. So in terms of duration of treatment, what we do know is that you require prompt anti-infective treatment, um, but you need to get cultures first. So the, the jury is still out on whether we're treating it for four to six weeks. Most authors are saying um, four weeks, other authors are saying six weeks. There's also really no consensus of whether it should be IV or oral, but they do go into talking about the disadvantages of IV and um, the complications of having IV, mainly being uh, drip site sepsis, having to convert from a peripheral line to a CVP to continue with IV. The principle that you want with your antibiotic. Yeah, I'll mean, just jump in here then. <coughs> and I'll, I'll talk loud, but the, the IV versus oral in adults has been put to rest. There was a multi, a, a, a prospective randomized trial from Oxford. Basically, there were worse long term outcomes with IV antibiotics because of long term lines, because of complicated. There were no increased benefits, but there were problems. So, so the story about four weeks or six weeks for adults is, is over. Yeah. So basically in terms of your antibiotics, this is what you want. Whether you can get this IV or orally, you want something that has high bioavailability, it can reach your MIC and it's also tolerable. Um, also the discussion of when to change to oral, um, it's a clinical, it's, uh, most authors agree that it's a clinical um, a judgment. So improvement of the general condition of the child in terms of the markers being um, the pulse and the, and the temperature, also a significant reduction in the CRP. So for surgery, um, surgery is indicated for two things. You want to obtain your biological samples if you weren't able to, let's say it was a hip joint and you can't get in there to aspirate it. Um, the knee, you can do a, a front room aspiration and send it off, but there are certain joints that are quite difficult to get to. So you, so surgery reduces intra-articular complications, mainly uh, cartilage damage and avascular necrosis, which is due to inflammation and increased joint pressure. Um, there's been discussion about whether you want open uh, debridement or washout or arthroscopically versus aspiration. So the management of the septic joint, it still remains controversial whether you want to do open or arthroscopically. Um, I'll get into it a little bit later about aspiration. So your arthrotomy, the open arthrotomy, it will allow you debridement with removal of the debris and breakdown of the inoculations, but it carries the mobility of open surgery and, and general anesthesia. Aspiration, on the other hand, it carries minimal mobility. It may not require a GA in the older child. It may, however, provide less satisfactory drainage of the joint. Um, and the joint in question here would be a hip joint. Arthroscopic washout is also another alternative with some potential advantages and is um, gaining popularity, particularly in the knee. So surgery itself, it alters the process of the bone necrosis, which reduces the vasculature and therefore penetration of antibiotics at the site of infection. It removes the demineralized bone and cleans the surrounding soft tissue, therefore re reducing bacterial load. So that is your actual reason for doing surgeries. You want to, re to reduce the bacterial load. Mm -hmm. So it's just one other reason in our setting, and that is that 20, between 10 and 20% of acute TB allergies presents in a manual fashion. 
So an interesting. So going into that, this is possibly going to refute what you are saying. No, no, with aspiration. Yeah. So there was a study done in Malawi. Um, uh, it was a randomized prospective study of six one patients. Uh, these patients were treated either by simple aspiration or by a thrombotomy and washout. What they found in their study, there was no significant difference between the two groups on either clinical or radiological assessment at one year follow-up. However, they do say it's still one year follow-up is it's not really a long-term follow-up and they still want uh, more study, more prospective studies to be done on this. Remember the downside of this is that it's the shoulder, it's easy to get to. Um, you can't you can't extrapolate this to a hip joint, uh, for an example. So, so what I'm saying is that they they didn't have TD in their series. No, they didn't. The other thing that we are is you, you didn't read this paper, but they they repeat aspirations. Yes. Every day they came in and they did it again and again and again and again. Mm. You're welcome to do that, but it's going to drive everyone mad. <laughs> yes. Every day. <laughs> Just so. Okay. Do you have a funny disease? I can't remember what the group is. It's almost a seasonal thing. Shoulders. We seldom see soft shoulders. They had some local form of disease that they presented with. Because it was only a couple of years they had 60 patients. Mm. Uh, I remember this. Yeah. Uh, I take the paper and I get it. They don't have TV in their group and they, they did. They some, did have like one. They was. did have on, on both arms. Uh, sickle cell patients as well. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. basically, in conclusion, we all know, and nothing much has changed. Septic arthritis is still a an emergency. I I I, I purposely left out orthopedic emergency. It's an emergency yeah. because the treatment is both medical and surgical. Early diagnosis or recognition is key for optical management. Um, empiric early antibiotics, um, which will then be adjusted once an organism is identified. Duration of treatment, um, it's the jury still out here at Red Cross, we do four weeks for the children. Um, but um, it's, it varies between four and six weeks. Um, joint deprivement, it's up to you. Um, open versus arthroscopically, you get tissue, you get fluid, Aspiration, it's, it's specific to, sp to, to certain joints, and I don't think any one of us would be brave enough to aspirate a septic arthritis of a hip or something like that. And the, this will be leading on to John's talk. Don't forget the outliers, such as Kingela Kingi. Do you guys questions or questions from outside? No questions. Can I ask you, <coughs> the stage? Um, I just want to, sorry, I just want to point out, I like the paper, mm. but be aware that the conference rooms are not here, you mentioned it, you don't, but didn't emphasize it, it was septic arthritis. Yes, of the hip. Yeah, got it. Hip, nothing. I left out another article that was um, going, how many people tried to extrapolate Papa to the knee. Uh, and if you did that, then you would miss up, up to 47% of knee septic arthritis if you apply soccer criteria to knee septic arthritis. I'll, I'll give you the study, I just didn't want to add it. You're just flexing now because you've got a drought. Hmm? So oh, that kid's right. Because you've got a drought. Because I've got that kid right. I know, I know. You're <laughs> Lots of flexing. Um, antibiotics. Antibiotics. In the very young, we are worried about immunizations not being in, not being up to date, and the relevance of Haemophilus influenza. So I think that 
all immunizations are looking towards herbs. Yeah, okay. So, so we should still be covered unless we're really, really breaking down. But in the isolate, to remember that most, most immunity actually only hits somewhere between 85 and 95 percent of the target of the audience. Mm -hmm. um, but depending on, on what you're immunizing against, that's going to be enough for an outbreak. So, so I've got deep in here uh, quite a nice graph. The immunizations came in in 97, probably it was a uh, precipitous drop in amophilus infections that remain static. We see one every two, three years. And each time we go in, it's got, and each time the question is, the subgroups of amophilus were, were just that. There were subgroups that targeted for meningitis, and we suspect that we're getting other subtypes. That's all it's happening. So, yeah, when, and when it happens, as Viola says, readjust your antibiotics. Add the ampicillin, which always covered it, yeah. and it's only really over the, between the age of six months and two years. Yeah, it's, so it's largely all in order. <coughs> so you, wouldn't, you don't routinely cover you. It's too rare to routinely cover you. It's not a problem with ampicillin. Let it go. Yeah, cool. yeah thank you. Yes. Yeah, you so excited about it. I'm so excited. That's I'm so excited. <laughs> Just, just feedback to the guys that there, there is a, just a bonus bottle of red wine coming your way if you finally have it. I myself was reading now this evening just before I got to it. But, um, but so yes. Sorry, Stuart, it sounds like yeah, one question. Um, yes. We, actually, two questions. Is, yes. is the sine qua non for, for septic arthritis, is it not pus in the joint? So I know with kids it's different, but if we aspirate and there's pus in the joint, we know it's septic arthritis. I know we can't routinely do it with kids, but in, in, that, in that gray phase where you're not sure, um, what is the role of a bone scan instead of an MRI? It's a bit cheaper. Um, and I feel like in this, in this setting, it can give us pretty much as much information. The combination between an ultrasound and a bone scan can tell us if there's any fusion or if the bone's involved. What do you think of that uh, combination as opposed to an MRI? So I almost don't want to say this out loud over, over an unprotected connection, but the, the problem with the problem with ultrasound, let's get ultrasound out there. I think an ultrasound's a good guide. The problem with it is that people, particularly non-orthopods, place an enormous strength to that examination, right or wrong. And an example I always give is, is uh, um, uh, Paul Maria, who he, he goes to theatre with a child, with a, a bones, a, a, an ultrasound positive query septic arthritis. The child's from ICU. He opens the hip joint and there is no pus. Now listen, he, he's just not a liar. He's not, I know him. He would not lie either way. He comes out of that and says, it was a dry joint. We go to the ICU and they say, but where was the pus? He says, no, well, I was there. They said, no, no, but on ultrasound, there was pus in the joint. And he's going, guys, you don't understand. I was in that joint. I was looking into it. I said, no, no, but look at the ultrasound report. Now my point is this, is that if, if the guys in ICU are prepared to put more weight on an ultrasound report than on a surgeon who's looked into a joint, you can understand why I'm nervous about the fact, A, that they can be wrong and they are, and then B, everybody then just jumps to that conclusion. I'm happy to go with the, the variability of a bone scan, and it's often also wrong, but at least we sort of say it's a guide. And I think that, that if you are in doubt, I, I do think... If you're looking at a specific joint, then MRI is probably the best investigation. If you're looking at a whole patient trying to distinguish which joint to drain, I think there your money's going to be up on a bone scan because that will then target. You know something's going on, you just don't know where to cut. That will then be helpful. So does that kind of make sense? And I don't want to dis the radiologist. They're wonderful. I really, we've got a very good relationship, but this one thing, the ultrasounds, we are so often wrong, and then we are so trusting that we're pushed into a corner where we do make mistakes. Okay. 
Shot. Thanks, Jed. So I'm going to talk about Kingella Kingi. That's something I've been getting quite excited about lately, which is okay. quite sad, but it's what happens in your registrar time, I guess. And over and above that, we might have a culture positive case in the ward at the moment, so uh, making it all more relevant. So it's an organism that's becoming um, increasingly more relevant in pediatric orthopedics and musculoskeletal infections. Um, it was only discovered in the 19, well, in 1960, and orthopedic relevance became apparent in the late 1980s. Since then, there's been a dramatic incidence, a dramatic increase in the incidence um, of its of its uh, you know, a dramatic increase in incidence, both because of our knowledge of it, so we start looking for it, but also our John. John, can you share your screen, bud? Is it not is it not sharing? No, we're looking at uh, the uh, Queen Bee's slides at the moment. Sorry to that's back in. That's fine. Um, but and, uh, yeah. Because it's up on our screen, yeah. Okay. So your screen share is paused. Here we go, stop sharing. Can you see now? No, we look, we look, hang on. No, not yet. Okay. So, Go to the Zoom thing. Here we go. And now it's on. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, we got it. Cool, thank you. You on? Yeah, it's good, thanks. Okay, sure. Sorry about that. Um, all right, so... <clears throat> Increasing incidence since we've started looking for it and since we've been, our labs have been able to find it. Uh, previously, these patients were, were called culture negative infections. And interestingly, as the, our rate of Kingella detection has increased, the rate of culture negative infection seems to be decreasing. Exact numbers are varied depending on what cohort you look at, with anything report, reports of between uh, 20 to 30 percent, right up to 50 percent in patients between the ages of between the age of six months and four years. Um, so that's the that's one of the big take home messages. It's this the specific age group that you're going to be thinking about this infection is children between the age of six months to four years. In in many of them, it's a normal commensal in the upper respiratory tract, and it's triggered by a viral upper respiratory tract infection. Um, so below six months, it's thought that the inherited immunity we get from our moms gives us protection. And at about 48 months, or most, most it starts at about 36 months, the, the incidence starts to decrease because we, our immune system becomes mature enough to develop antibodies to the polysaccharide capsule. So if you're seeing someone with a Kingella Kingi infection outside of this age range, should ring alarm bells for an immunodeficiency. It shouldn't really happen. Um, yeah, so as I said, it, it's going to follow an upper respiratory tract infection, but the clinical presentation is relevant for the fact that it's a, typically a milder disease course. So these patients often present in the second week of, of, their, of their illness um, with symptoms that have been grumbling along. <clears throat> and this requires a high index of suspicion from the treating clinician, because as Chironi et al. in 2011 showed, that 43% of patients presented with a normal CRP and were afebrile and ended up being culture positive for, um, for King Yellow King. Along those same lines, if it's going to cause osteitis, this was most likely going to be a subacute osteitis. But this is not to say that it's an irrelevant infection or uh, mild and can be ignored because if it goes on to cause endocarditis, it has an associated mortality rate of 10%. So I don't want to bore you with the microbiology, except to say that it's a facultative anaerobic gram-negative coccobacillus, part of the Neisseria family. So facultative anaerobe meaning it can grow in anaerobic conditions, but it prefers to grow in oxy with oxygen, which is important when it comes to how we're going to culture it. So it's, it's notoriously difficult to culture, and it's one of the reasons why we weren't aware of it and why probably we don't see it a lot in, in our settings. We're not specifically looking for it. It's slow growing and temperature sensitive. Um, 
And in a study that looked at, they retrospectively looked at all the cases that were positive, they found that only 15% of them were, were positive on the gram stain. So if you're not specifically looking for it, you're very unlikely to find it. So in our setting, the best way to go about doing this is to use these, the, uh, the adults, the, so the large volume, blood culture, medium bottles, so back to alert or back tech, and specifically the aerobic one. The reason that it's the adult one and not the pediatric one is not 100% certain. The theorized that it's just the larger volume, they're not sure, but, um, but definitely grows better in the adult bottles than in pediatric bottles. You also need to tell the laboratory that it's coming, um, or at least tell them what you're looking for, because it's got a, quite a specific way that it's cultured using chocolate agar or sheep's blood hemoglobin. Culture takes about three to five days, and there's not much value in extended cultures. So although it's difficult to culture, if you get it you know, in, your, in the proper aerobic blood culture bottle and onto the right culture plates, um, you should have an answer at about four days. So elsewhere, it's relevant for us, this is maybe more sort of futuristic, but molecular diagnostic techniques are becoming increasingly more important. So this is things like um, PCR of surface enzymes, etc., where not only does it make your, your testing significantly more sensitive, it also brings down the time from diagnosis from about uh, four days to four hours. I don't think, I think it'll be a while before we see this in, in our setting. Um, it's, you know, lucky for us, a bacteria that's difficult to grow is also fortunately very sensitive to most of the antibiotics that we use in musculoskeletal practice or musculoskeletal infections. Um, so it's, it's got MRCs that are very easily achieved for your cephalosporins, ampicillins, rifampicin, and then less commonly, we use macrolides, aminoglycosides, fluoroquinolones, and tetracyclines. Of relevance here is the third line. Um, we're often using cloxacillin and, and flucloxacillin. So it's not resistant to these, but it has a relatively higher MIC um, that you need to achieve if you want to treat it. So while cloxacillin will work, it's not the, it's not the ideal um, antibiotic. And then in almost all the strains that were cultured, they were resistant to clindamycin and your glycopeptide antibiotics such as vancomycin. So ideally, and I think that's why it works. Yeah. Yeah. And so exactly. So I think that is why it works. So it, it will still be treated. I think ideally, though, if you if you do make the diagnosis, you could change to a second or third generation cephalosporin, or if you're thinking along the lines of diagnosis down referring with oral antibiotics, you could go to ampicillin and then amoxicillin on, on discharge. Because although we're getting high doses of our clocks, when we're changing to flu clocks, maybe not as well orally tolerated. I don't know exactly what those MICs are and how much of a, a, a plasma concentration you need to achieve them, but um, yeah, clocks will work, it's just not, it's not the best for it. So treatments, they were difficult to except give that, yes. Yes. <clears throat> except that it's actually kind of an overall sense of organ. It's quite weak. a weak organism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Well, I think that's, that's why we, it hasn't been a disaster up until now. We, we haven't been looking for it. We haven't been finding oh, it. Yeah. And yet it's it's yeah, it's yeah. quite common. Yeah. Or maybe. We've been looking and uh, uh, taking point about the bad tech bottle. We'll, we'll check right on there. Change. But maybe because they presented the upper respiratory tract to the GP or you know, the pediatrician, no, they just want to they they make a box key. Exactly. So they can't you or oxal. So you have to wonder how yeah. they, they come with a low grade subacute you know, type of infection. Mm. Maybe that's mm. the reason. Okay. Potentially. Um, so fairly weak evidence, but the recommendation was for two to three weeks of antibiotics, possibly also highlighting the fact that it's quite a weak bacteria. Um, with So that's for septic arthritis, a bit longer for osteitis, and then a very wide range recommended for spondylodiscitis. 
So in conclusion, we have a high index of suspicion in children between the age of six months and four years. It has a milder disease course, so be aware and look for it, and don't be fooled by a, an afebrile patient. Endocarditis is a possibility, and this portrays a, a high mortality rate. Use the aerobic culture bottles. Um, clocks will work, but it does have a higher MIC, um, and potentially second or third generation cephalosporins or ampicillin is the way, or is the recommendation once you've made the, the, the definitive diagnosis. Thanks, Gus. So, to, Jonathan, don't go away. So, yes. so, based on this, mm -hmm. so the background is this I've asked the question over and over of the microbiology department. Given what we currently, yes. we currently doing, should we, are we doing what we should be doing to get it? The answer I've been given is yes. And, and it's always bothered me that we've never seen it before. But both, both yourself and now myself, that text story on the second route. Would you recommend that we change to back tech bottles in septic arthritis? And if so, you know, if so, in which sub? I think I think we should. I think between six months, six and forty-eight months. 48. So so I'm 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 not gonna change the department, but for, for me, I'm gonna culture my six six to forty-eight months. Septic arthritis kitties. I'm going to do a, a no, fact check based, based on this and the fact that we've never, I know, because we've looked through it, we've never seen a, a king in it for once. So, why and we reviewed all of the organisms that we did see. So, so, I think it's worth looking for. And, and based on this, I mean, the numbers are significant. Mm -hmm. We should be seeing a predominant organism up to the age of about three, four. Yeah, of king in yeah. So it's not that we're looking for the one in a hundred. In that age group, we're looking for the one in two. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. those numbers all come out of out of first world uh, sort of no, developed world. world. Developed world. Countries. Countries. Sorry? High income, high income countries like Israel, Canada, the US, and Europe. And the 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 the, the thinking was that they had more advanced um, laboratory techniques for discovering it, but perhaps there is something else that, that we are, the incidence is not as high. So, so I dispute that. I think that the only reason that we've got now the so called, well, there are two reasons we've got a so called southern strain of COVID. The one is we, we just had a, a burden of disease that allowed us to breed out so many in a variant. Mm. But the second important thing is that we've got laboratory sophisticated enough to bring it up in the first place. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? They were never to find this elsewhere because they didn't have it. So I don't buy into the fact that we, we, we have the technical capability to be looking for on this organism. That doesn't explain it. There's something else missing, and I think this might be it. Too. So I think we're going to, I think we should start with a possible message in that subgroup, magnetic models. Wow. Have Yeah. We only have a bit. I'm content with it. Content, yeah. 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 Happiness is a big Yeah. Happiness is happiness is elusive. Okay. Who's the very quiet? What's the story? You see. I'm here. I'm here. I'm just I'm just taking. Taking. Just taking. <laughs> okay. I'll be talking about uh, acute osteomyelitis. Um, okay. Not dealing with a with a chronic. Osteomyelitis in this talk. Just find out if uh, you can see. Yeah, you can see. Yeah. So, just in terms of definitions and uh, uh, nomenc uh, nomenclature, 
osteitis and osteomyelitis is used interchangeably in the, in the current literature. And it basically means infection of the bone marrow, which refers to osteomyelitis, or bone, which is osteitis, which is caused by a bacterial pyogenic infection. A term that's also used in, in uh, bone and joint infections in, in, in pediatrics is osteoarticular infections. And this compromises the spectrum of disorders um, depending on the local, localization of the infection. Like I said, osteomyelitis in the bone marrow, septic arthritis in the joint, it could be a combination of both, or it could be spondylodiscitis, which is in the spine. Um, acute osteomyelitis occurs in about one in 5,000 children, um, and usually occurs in kids under the age of 10. The mean age is about six and a half, um, and boys are more common to, to get acute osteomyelitis, two and a half times more common due to um, their sus susceptibility uh, to micro trauma. The reason why the less than 10 age group is more susceptible is because there's a rich metaphysical blood supply um, and this kids, these kids um, usually have an immature immune system. It's not uncommon in, in healthy kids, uh, but it does have a high incidence in, um, uh, in children uh, from poverty-stricken areas or low socioeconomic status. Um, the risk factors for developing acute osteomyelitis include um, your hemoglobinopathies, like sickle cell anemia, um, patients that are immune compromised, like you know, type 1 diabetics in kids, Juvenile, um, juvenile arthritis. Um, these kids are usually on steroids. Um, chronic renal failure, your acquired um, immunodeficiencies and your primary immunodeficiencies. Varicella is also a risk factor as these vesicles are usually um, secondary um, infected due to uh, pruritus. Prematurity and repeated venesections are also known risk factors. Um, these organisms can um, reach the bone either by hematogenous spread or by direct inoculation due to trauma or surgery. Hematogenous spread is usually secondary to contiguous infection. This infection seeds into the metaphysis where the environment is ideal for bacterial growth. Um, in our setting, most of the cases are either micro trauma or uh, direct inoculation or hematogenous spread. This initial bacteremia can occur from skin lesions, like I mentioned before, infection or poor dentition. And this leads to a, a cascade of microscopic and macroscopic activities. So in terms of the microscopic activity, um, blood supply in the metaphysical blood capillaries undergo sharp turns. And just before they reach the, the venous sinusoids, um, the flow becomes sluggish, sluggish and turbulent, and this predisposes to bacterial um, deposition. It also has a low pH and low oxygen tension, and this is ideal for, for bacterial growth. Um, the spread through the bone occurs through the ovation uh, canals, as well as the Falkman system. Um, this bacteremia occurs after local defense, um, bone defenses have been overwhelmed with a, with a marked uh, bacterial load. This leads to purulence um, in conjunction with osteoblast necrosis, osteoclast activation, um, the release of inflammatory mediators and blood vessel thrombosis. In terms of your micro, uh, macroscopic uh, activity, you get a subperiosteal abscess, and this um, abscess breaks through the uh, uh, metaphysical cortex. Septic arthritis can develop, when the uh, parallelism breaks through the uh, intraarticular metaphysical cortex, like your, your hip, your shoulder, your elbow, and the ankle. It's not commonly seen in the knee. Um, the reason for this is under the age of 18, the um, device is vascularized by transphysical uh, vessels, uh, and this facilitates um, hematogenous spread. Of the bone from the metaphysis into the epiphysis and into the joint. So there's a wide variety of organisms 
Um, and this is either related to a specific disease or a specific um, yeah, condition or disease. So by far your most common is your, your staph aureus, whether it's um, staph sensitive or staph resistant. Um, with your staph aureus, there's this um, uh, a PVL or pet, uh, pantin valentine leukocytin, which is a cytotoxic antigen um, on your staph aureus, and this leads to an activation um, of a cascade um, that releases um, exotoxins. These exotoxins make the, the, the organism more virulent and leads to a more aggressive disease uh, process, as well as tissue, tissue necrosis um, um, with destruction of your neutrophils. Uh, PVL positive strains is associated with complex multifocal infections, prolonged fever, uh, large abscesses, DVTs due to thrombosis, um, and sepsis require, requiring more aggressive and long-term um, anti, uh, uh, antibiotic therapy. And also uh, these patients often require um, repeated um, uh, visits to the to theater. The other organism, um, common organism in your, in your neonates is um, your group uh, B strep. Um, I was remembering group B is bad for babies. And as we mentioned before, your king, king yellow. Um, pseudomonas, um, think about pseudomonas in patients with a, with a foot wound and or presents with calcaneal osteitis. We mentioned the Imophilus before. Um, other common, common ones in our city is, is TB and patients with, with salmonella, frequently grow salmonella. <laughs> um, patients with sickle cells frequently uh, grow salmonella. In terms of the classification, it can be acute, subacute, or chronic, and this is based on, on when the time period acute is less than two, subacute is between two and six weeks, and chronic is more than six weeks, plus radiographic evidence of sequestering and endocrine. Um, your history patients present with non weight bearing, uh, recent local infection or trauma. Trauma is usually is a, a 30%. Well, trauma is, is about 30% of patients uh, says they have a history of trauma, but it might not be relevant uh, to the osteitis. Um, obtaining immunization history, as we mentioned before, and ask about previous antibiotic um, use, as this might mark your, 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 uh, ask your symptoms. Um, in our setting, patients often present late, and they already present with most of the time with the sub uh, periosteal abscess. Symptoms include uh, limp or refusal to weight bear. Usually they're not toxic, but they can present in septic shock. Um, they can have an endocarditis as well as a, a, a empyema, which is just a picture of Stewart with a stethoscope listening to a patient for a murmur or, or you know, rub. <laughs> Clinically, they're, they're often dehydrated uh, due to the fever or uh, the fact that they weren't uh, eating uh, days prior, and they may or may not present with, with fever. If a patient does not have fever um, on presentation, it does not mean that they don't have uh, osteomyelitis. Clinically, look for red, warm, swollen, fluctuant, uh, tender limb. I always say that a patient, um, kids does not develop a, a cellulitis and they, they always, some of them uh, end up with the surgeons for a prolonged uh, period treated with antibiotics when in fact they have um, osteitis. So kids, that, kids do not develop a cellulitis and always look for infection or tumor. Uh, and clinically always look for uh, uh, multifocal uh, um, lesions. Joints and they have a decreased range of motion 
So x-rays are, are fairly non-specific and it's usually to rule out a fractural malignancy and they have a less, less than 20% sensitivity and, sensitivity and specificity. Um, if you do obtain a, a, a x-ray, like Payanda mentioned earlier, is um, soft tissue uh, swelling or there's loss of um, soft tissue contours. Around about five to seven days, they develop a periosteal reaction. There may or may not be osteolitis if they present with a subacute um, uh, osteomyelitis. And late, um, they, might, they may have metaphysical purification, which is basically a reduction in metaphysical bone density. CT scans are not um, helpful in the acute setting, but, but also with, with chronic osteomyelitis cases. The gold standard is uh, MRI. If your, di if your diagnosis is in, in doubt, um, it detects um, abscesses and shows early um, signal change in your marrow. So in your T1 um, with gadolinium, um, they have an increased signal, um, as well as on your T2, they have an increased signal. It has an 80, 80 to 100% um, sensitivity. Um, as you had mentioned before, if you don't know if, one, if more than one joint is involved, especially in a, a very ill child that's not getting better in ICU, you, um, obtain a, a bone scan. It has a 92 sensitivity, and a cold scan does not mean the patient, a uh, cold scan can be associated with more aggressive um, infection. In terms of your lab workup, you can do a white cell count, CRP, ESR, procalcitonin, and blood culture. Your white cell count. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's just indications. Yeah. yeah. So the, the bear in mind that your bone scan is going to go through a cycle. Of phases. Yeah. Initially, it's going to be hot. Uh, then, in, in between being hot and cold, the cold scan, in fact, is very specific for infection. So overall, sensitivity is high, but the chat. But sensitive to something going on. Okay. Uh, we'll have more skin. The, the cold scan is far more specific to actually have an osteitis. Okay. okay. So if you see, if you, if you know that there's something going on. Yeah. So, 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 so let, let's put it this way. <clears throat> if you, if you, many things might give you a white scan, including a fracture, for example. Yeah. Or a tube, but the very few things are going to give you the combination of the acute presentation and the cold scan, and that's going to be the infection. So, so sensitivity to warning should something's happening, but specificity to say this is infection, and that's the cold scan. Um, so, while I saw comment, um, only elevated in about 25% um, of patients, and this um, correlates poorly with, with treatment response. As your CRP is elevated in 98%, it raises very quickly with, with infection, and it's the most sensitive to, to treatment response as it decreases with post-operatively after the, after the theater or with um, antibiotics. High levels on admission is associated with a more virulent organism, um, more local or, and disseminated um, complications, and they may require longer duration of antibiotics. Your ESR is elevated in 90% of cases, um, also raises between three and five days, but it takes a long time to, 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 to come down. We do not have uh, facilities for procalcitonin, but it's very uh, specific to bacterial infection and it's usually negative in viral infections. So, so we do, but we need to kind of motivate for it. Oh, it's quite expensive. We just need to ask, we need to push on. Sure. Uh, so frequently in ICU in certain settings, but too expensive to retain these mm -hmm. um, Blood culture is positive only in about uh, 30 to 50%. And will be 
likely negative, especially if the patient had um, pre-op antibiotics. Um, yeah. Bone aspiration and, and bone biopsy. Um, I wasn't aware of, of bone aspiration itself um, as a treatment. Uh, and I'm not sure how, how they do it in the literature, but um, this helps with the different to get a basically a, a, a positive culture. Um, and bone biopsy is, is, is fairly different. So I'll, so, uh, I don't know what bone aspiration is. It's bone decompression is a drill into the bone. That's how I distinguish it. Yeah, you just, like, how do you do it practically? I mean, if you go into theater, big needles go around top. Yeah, <laughs> then you might as well take the patient to theater. Yeah. Anyhow. Yeah. Um, treatment can be operatively or non operatively, as in the case with septic arthritis. The non-operative management um, can be either with oral or IV antibiotics, it's been another uh, debate. And your surgical options are debridement, drainage of the, of the abscess, uh, get source control, and this also allows you to take cultures at that point. IV antibiotics is indicated in early disease with no subperiosteal abscess or abscess within the, in the joint. Uh, as mentioned before, um, we begin with broad spectrum antibiotics and then we, we revert to organism specific. If a gram stain is as a gram um, negative bacilli, um, add your third generation to so first board to possibly um, cover for your kidney. This, this I found quite interesting. Um, switch to orals when your CRP is less than 50% of preoperative CRP. And then the things that we know is clinical improvement in temperature, pain, um, heart rate at about 48 to 72 hours. Um, again, you mentioned prolonged I. Uh, I and IV antibiotics use uh, and their complications also has a higher cost and long, longer hospital stay. Oral has the same efficacy um, as IV antibiotics in a randomized controlled trial um, done by uh, Bob Talwar. So he treated patients initially with, um, with IV, IV, IV antibiotics uh, for two to four days and then switched them um, to oral antibiotics. So he treated the oral antibiotics for 20 days and the IV antibiotics for 30 days. We found no difference or the same, same um, efficacy. Um, oral is associated with poor compliance and high, high doses leads to um, GIT irritation. Uh, Joe Wagotsky uh, et al. in his cohort showed that um, three weeks of um, oral antibiotics is good enough. Um, so essentially the take home message there is treat for at least three weeks. Um, and he also initially treated them with IV antibiotics till about four days and then switched to oral and treated them um, for three weeks after. Um, in our institution, we, we tend to treat them between four and six weeks, especially if there's severe disease, multifocal sites, Diffuse bone involvement, and if there was hemodynamic instability, on the patient into ICU. Um, surgical management um, is indicated for deep or superior abscess, or that patient that initially was treated with IV antibiotics was not responding in the world. Um, it's also indicated in your chronic osteomyelitis to, to debride your size or do a sequestrator. If you go for, for surgery, go for the metaphysis because that's where the money is. Avoid drilling in the, the diaphysis as this leads to stress rises um, and, and later possible pathological fractures. And this I, I learned recently. Uh, don't be too aggressive um, with your, with your debridements um, unless there's an obvious sequestrium 
in that patient that has gone to theater multiple times and, and, and is not getting better. And we protect them in a slab or traction depending on what the site of the osteomyelitis was. So the complications, um, in Andrea's um, series, she found a 48% complication rate. And these include pathological fractures. Um, it's often in patients with um, possibly that is pre-drilled, diffuse um, disease. Um, we usually admit them for rest, splint them, and we allow the involucrum to develop. Um, they can get fires with a rest if it, involve, if it involves the, the physis, and this can lead to growth arrest or angular deformities. And interestingly, um, in about less than 10% of patients develop a DVT, then the risk factors for, for developing a DVT is a CRP of less than six, which is um, age more than eight, a patient that went to theater for a debridement and an MRSA. And in our setting, we often don't put them on, on, on DVT prophylaxis, but I know in ICU they do they want uh, DVT prophylaxis. Other complications include um, meningitis and bronchopneumonia, as we mentioned before. Um, and the obvious one is chronic osteomyelitis. Um, so the take home message here is uh, children don't develop cellulitis, look for infection uh, or malignancy. Um, Debride, get cultures. Um, and drain, don't be too aggressive with, uh, with, with bone. Um, IV antibiotics initially and then switch to oral when it's clinical improvement and be aware of um, known complications. Cool.